Welcome to the 33rd video in the Just In Case series sponsored by um, Quality and Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. Um, the mini series is called Just In Case, just in case you need reminding of something, just in case you didn't know something, just in case you want to learn something. And today our contributor is Bob Marshak. Now, Professor Marshak needs no further introduction because he did two other just in case video before this. Um, and so I instead of spending the time to reintroduce him to you, I want to talk about what he is going to talk about. Um, in change, often that we don't actually hit success. Um, of course, there are multiple factors behind it, but one of the factor is we have completely ignored the covert processes that are operating underneath the surface. And most issues in change are indeed quite covert. And it is vital for change agents to realize what are they and how they might impact on the change process, both in acceptance and resistance movement, and also find ways to work with them. I don't think you can manage covert processes, but how do you, once you identify how you work with that? Bob originally published this book in um, 2006, and when it first came out, it really changed the life of so many change agents. Many of us just couldn't have enough to learn about this. And these issues are so complicated. So today I asked Bob, uh, would he please <laughs> do a 101, you know, an introduction of covert processes so that those of you who have not learned to work with covert process will get the fundamentals from him. And Bob st kindly start this video with an explanation about why things are covert before defining what covert processes are. And then from then, he provides suggestion how we can see these hidden processes and what action we can take to engage with covert processes. Um, Bob's wisdom and wittiness and his amazing way to describe these things will captivate you and, and me, of course, um, during the whole presentation. And I hope that you would um, enjoy his video as much as I do, and not just enjoy, but really learn to reflect on the way that you support change. And Bob, thank you so much um, in this difficult time living in Miami with the covert uh, situation so bad. You continue to be willing to invest time and energy uh, for the community that um, this sets of video are aimed for. So with a big thank you, I turn over the time to you, Bob. Hello, I'm Bob Marshak, and today I'd like to talk to you about covert processes, or another way of thinking about it is the hidden dynamics of organizations and organizational change. In my discussion this morning, there's some points that I'd like to ask you to do some thinking. So you might start thinking about an organization uh, example that you're working on now, maybe a change project or something like that, so that when I ask you to reflect on something, you have something to focus on. So let's get started, and let me begin by saying a little bit about why are things covert or why are things hidden in organizations? Well, one of the reasons they are is because people are afraid to say something. There are unexpressed dynamics. They are denied dynamics because people are afraid that something will happen to them by expressing it because it's considered an, an inappropriate topic, an illegitimate topic, a topic that people don't uh, approve of in some way or another. So people deny it and hide it. Another reason that things are not discussed or not uh, out in the open for people to deal with is because it's in the blind spot of the person or the organization. Perhaps it's a cultural bias. Perhaps it's a way of thinking that they don't see something. So it's a blind spot in what they're doing. And a third reason that things are often uh, unexpressed or denied is because it's in the unconscious of an individual or a team or an organization, the psychodynamics of a situation. I raise that because it is a dynamic that happens in organizations. It's not necessarily one that we address every day in terms of what we do, but if we're going to talk about covert processes as a topic in general, then that certainly is one of them. 
Now, one of the things I want to start out with is when people hear the term covert processes, they think of spies, they, hidden, they think of people trying to manipulate the system. And that generates a notion that hidden dynamics and covert processes are somehow bad. And they are whatever's involved is somebody doing something they shouldn't. That certainly is one definition. But in my discussion today, I'd like to take you into some other territory. People hide things that are uh, important to them and that they are afraid that something will happen to them if it's revealed. In other words, they, uh, they use covert processes to protect against threats. The term covert comes from the French word couvert, which is to cover. And sometimes the term to cover is I'm going to cover you or you'll be covered or provide me with cover. And in that sense, cover is a protection against threat. So one of the ways that I think about it is people hide their vices, that's for sure. People hide their vulnerabilities, but people also hide their valuables. And so oftentimes things that are not open or discussed are things that are very precious to people, very important to people, but they're afraid that if they put them out, they'll be trampled on or stepped on. And I'll say a little bit more about that as we go. So I'd like you to think about hidden dynamics in organizations as neutral, that they're not inherently good or bad, they're simply hidden until we learn more about them. So let me begin with some different topics and I'm going to touch on some different things. I'm planting some ideas as I go and you can think about them later. So the first one I'd like you to think about is that there is a organizational emphasis in most organizations to think about change and think about organizations rationally that the way to deal with things is a rational analysis of something. And so when you deal with change, it's the case for change. And the case for change is almost always a rational case for change. And often organizations and leaders and managers think that that's what you need. Well, that is always important and it's a necessary condition for change, but it's insufficient because there are other dynamics that are often overlooked, are hidden, are not dealt with in one way or another that impede the organization's ability to deal with things. So one of them is politics. Organizations don't normally approve of the notion that we are doing things politically, unless you are a political organization or perhaps a public organization. But in my experience, many change efforts and many ongoing efforts in the organizations are impeded by not thinking about the political dynamics of what's going on. In other words, individuals, groups, units in the organization have needs and interests. And those needs and interests play themselves out. And they don't always follow the organization chart and they don't always follow the rational rules of management. In fact, they, they follow rules of how people interact when they're trying to get their needs met, bargaining, negotiation, the use of power or whatever else. So the inability to put out openly to discuss in an effort that we're doing, what are the politics of the situation? Who are the power players? How do they make decisions? How do you deal with something? So for me, I often advise my clients that yes, think about how that needs to happen rationally, but also think about it as a political campaign. If you were trying to get your change effort implemented politically, how would that be? So organizations are both rational instruments but there are also political dynamics. Another dynamic that doesn't uh, get expressed openly because it's often not approved of is emotions, people's feelings. And that can be negative feelings like anger or sadness. Uh, well, sadness for some is negative, for others it's not. And, but also joy and happiness. And the inability to express emotions or to dampen emotions is often seen as necessary, so rationality will prevail. But it misses an important element of what people need to deal with in, in change. And there's another aspect of it as well. And that there's some belief that people do not change because they're rationally convinced of a change, but they change because they are attracted to the change and they want to have it happen, that they are emotionally connected to it in some way. And so you need to put out something that will capture people's emotional commitment, and they do it even if reason says it may not happen. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in my next item, which is inspirations. Now, this is an interesting one because most people don't think of things inspirational as covert. But often people do not put out their higher ideals, their hopes and dreams, 
their inspirations that they would like to see implemented because they would be accused of pie in the sky, too good to be true, you're really a dreamer. And so they're ridiculed a little bit when they put out something like that. And so they misses the energy of the inspirational ideal. You don't have to be an inspirational person, but can you touch on things that inspire people, even if it's done in a more rational kind of a way? So often the things that would inspire people to do things are also not openly dealt with, are they poo-pooed in certain kinds of ways. Another aspect uh, that is often neglected is what are the mindsets? Mindsets is a way of saying the way that people think about things. Perhaps the simplest way to say it is what's the culture of the organization, the unspoken assumptions, the unspoken ways of looking at things, the theories, the paradigms of uh, perhaps the disciplines that the organization uh, implements, uh, uses in what it does at work, or perhaps the unspoken theory about how business gets done or how you get promoted. Those kinds of things provide blinders and filters to what people do. And if they're not addressed, then the limitations that they provide are not addressed. And often that impedes a change effort. And then a final element is psychodynamics. And again, we're back to the unconscious. We're back to the notion of what kinds of things are going on on an unconscious level in organizations. And so you might think for a moment in the change effort that you're working on, and what's the rational reason for the change? But what's the politics of the situation? What are the emotions that could be involved? Are there unspoken inspirations that are out there? Are there things that could be in the mindset of what's going on that need to be reconsidered? And are there any kind of unconscious processes being manifested in the group that you're dealing with? For example, fight flight, which is a way of dealing with unconscious anxiety. And so that people seem to be reflexively running away from the issue or attacking you or the problem that's there. And that may be a signal to you that there are some unconscious dynamics going on and rationally reasoning about them won't necessarily work. So now I'd like to take you to another way of thinking about uh, covert processes or hidden dynamics. And that's by using a metaphor that is almost universally used in one way or another in most uh, cultures. And that is what's on the table and what's under the table. And I'm going to add an element to that and say what's above the table. And so though, when you think about those three places, what's on the table are the kinds of things that are routinely discussed in the organization. They're part of everyday conversations, often things having to do with finances and budgets and performance and things like that are routinely discussed. People engage them and are the idea with, they may not deal with them well, but they're almost always there. There are other kinds of things that are considered somehow inappropriate, or this is not the right time or place, or we don't really want to talk about them. And so they never get on the table. They're never openly talked about. They are at the water cooler in the hallways, but not openly in, in an engaged session. Or somebody may bring up the topic gee, how come we are uh, favoring these people and not those people? Gee, how come so-and-so makes more money than, than such and such? Gee, are, are we dealing with all our, our warts and difficulties? Gee, are we talking about our feelings about the boss? Those kinds of topics which are considered inappropriate or people feel very threatening to talk about, if somebody puts it on the table, it gets knocked off the table. So the issue is what goes on the table and will stay on the table and be engaged in an open kind of a way versus it never gets on the table or it gets knocked off. Now there's a third way of thinking and that's what's above the clouds, what's above the table. And that's the place for hidden hopes and dreams. That's the place for people's higher values and ideals and the kinds of things again that are not put on the table because it is considered too good to be true, because it is considered to be something that is too idealistic. And if somebody puts that up, say, gee, can't we be all we can be? And why can't we do this as an organization? And everybody looks at them with a smirk on their face and say, oh, come on, get real. What are you smoking? Get grounded. Get down to earth. Let's be real here. This is a business. This isn't a whatever. That's too airy fairy, whatever else it is. And so people learn that that's not a topic to be raised in the group or the, or the organization. So let me go through that again very quickly because I'd like to take a moment and ask you to reflect on some things. So again, what's on the table? Again, these are the things that are easy to talk about, widely talked about, or at least engaged, even if they can be tough. 
So I'd like to ask you for a moment, reflect on your organization or your situation and what's on the table right now in that organization. And as I'm saying this, reflect for a moment. And if you're watching this on a video, you might pause the video now so you can think about that. Or if you're watching this video with some other people, you could pause the video right now and talk amongst yourselves about what's on the table. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is what is um, under the table. So again, under the table are things that are considered inappropriate, Ill illegitimate, uh, not safe to discuss. And so again, I'll ask you for a moment, reflect for a moment, what's under the table right now in your organization or in the issue you're dealing with and I'm going to pause for a moment and let you think again about what do you think is under the table? Not being expressed, it's there, or if it's brought up, it gets knocked off the table. And again, I'll pause for a moment, and now I'll go on to the next one, which is what's above the clouds. Again, this is the part that's too good to be true. These are the higher ideals. This is the be all you can be. So what are some of the kinds of things that right now, maybe they're not being expressed and you're not aware of, but what do you think are in the higher ideals of, the, of yourself or the people in the organization that are not being dealt with openly because people are afraid to put them on the table? So reflect for a moment about what might be above the table, above the clouds uh, in, in your organization or in your situation. And I'll just pause for a moment and then we'll go on to the next topic. Now, one of the things that people uh, raise is, well, if something is hidden, how do you know it's there? How do you see something that isn't there? So I'm going to give you some basic ideas, and then I'm going to give you a little quiz. So the basic ideas is the way you see what's, what's a covert process is you see what's missing. Now, we are trained to, to fill in the gaps. Our minds work as gestalts. We close up things that are, that are open. Our eyes see things with a blind spot because of how you're uh, connected into your brain, and there is an inherent blind spot, but we never see that because our brains cover it up. So what happens in organizations is we, we miss what's missing. So it's training yourself to see the, the space between the leaves on the tree, not the leaves on the tree. And the way you do that is you notice in conversations or you notice on what's going on an omission. Somehow there's a, there's a gap there that, that ought to be expressed, is usually expressed, in most situations is talked about, but somehow it's not coming up in this one. Or perhaps you might notice there's an overemphasis on certain elements, which is to neglect others. That's the old magician's trick of I do something to get your attention, but then you miss what I'm doing with my other hand. And so um, what happens is, that it uh, is a dynamic that is you're trying to deal with by seeing what's not there. So you notice emphases and omissions in an expected pattern, what, what normally happens, and it's not happening in this case, and what's happening given the context that we're in. So normally in a meeting that we would have Monday afternoons, we would start out a certain way and have a certain kind of discussion. But this Monday, it's different. There's a gap there. There's somebody who didn't show up. There's something that didn't happen. And so now you start wondering, why is that not being dealt with? Why is that thing being discussed? I have often found that when I went into organizations and I would talk to people about issues that they were dealing with, they might describe a, a particular topic or particular issue. And I'd say, well, who all is involved in that or who should come to the meeting? And they begin to tell me what's in their organization or and then I look at that, and if I know something about the organization, I find myself often saying, well, what about Sally? What about George? What about uh, this office? What about that office? And they say, oh, well, yeah, you're right. They're critically involved. And often what turns out is that particular person or that office is exactly the person or office that that particular person has difficulty with. And so it shows up by an omission in what they're saying, but it's really very revealing. So I tend to spend a lot of time trying to focus not only what am I hearing, but also what am I not hearing. So let's give you a little test of that. So up on your screen should be uh, something. And if you take a look at that, uh, you take a moment and think, what comes to mind? What does that look like? Um, if I had to tell Bob what's missing there, I would tell him what? 
And if you're like most people who see this, they will say what's missing are three, six, nine. And I would say, well, how do you know that? And they'd say, well, it's, it's a familiar sequence. It's the count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we know that, we're familiar with it, and so we, we, it's easy to see what's missing when we understand the pattern or the context. So let's take another one that might be a little more difficult for some of you. So I'm gonna put up another one to take a look at, and you can tell me what comes to mind when you see it. Now in this one, a little trickier perhaps, uh, depending on uh, where, where you are and who you are watching this, if you're like many people, uh, they uh, will see something that looks to them maybe like an algebraic equation. X plus 10 equals question mark. Um, and then they'll say, but there are the commas in there, X comma plus comma, and that throws them off a little bit. But then they do what a lot of people do when they collect data in organizations and they theme it. They have something that doesn't fit what they think the pattern is, and they throw it away. Gee, I have this leftover stuff. Uh, it doesn't fit anything else. I'll just, you know, it's just noise in the system. When in actuality, it's a signal of what might be there. So let's go back and look at this again. X comma plus comma 10. Well, what if the commas are, are suggesting something else, which is these are three items that are similar? Well, if we say that, What's similar to a 10? Well, the X now potentially is a stylized way of doing the Roman numeral 10. So if the X is a 10 and the other 10 is an Arabic 10, then that must mean something in the middle that we've been saying for some of us is a plus sign must be 10. Well, where is 10 look like a plus sign? Well, that's how you write 10 in Chinese. And if you are Japanese or Korean or anyone who uses Chinese characters, you potentially would have seen this right away uh, and known immediately that this is three different ways of writing the numeral 10, the number 10. And why do I put that up? Because often we are culturally blind to what's going on. That people within a culture immediately pick up what's going on, but those of us who are outside of the culture or outside of that mindset don't see it because it doesn't fit our pattern. So now let's look at another concept, and that is, all right, I've noticed something. How do I get it on the table? How do I put it on the table? Now, this gets to be very complex in some ways, but I'm going to simplify and say there's two essential things that you need to be able to do to get something on the table. The first one that you have to do is you have to create safety. You have to create a safe enough environment. Now, when I say safety, a lot of people think I mean perfect safety. No, I mean safe enough. When you cross the street, you look both ways, you know how to do it, you check on things and, and, and try and make sure that it's safe enough to cross the street. Is it perfect safety? No. You want it safe enough so that people are willing to engage something. So what's involved in that? Well, we're right back to the notion that often people hide things because there's a threat. So you need to minimize fear and threat in whatever context that you're in, trying to get something on the table. If there's too much fear and too much threat, it's not going to be discussed, it's not going to be dealt with. That means you also have to deal with psychological safety. Not physical safety, but psychological. What for the individuals there is psychologically safe? What are they afraid of as individuals? How they might say something that will be ridiculed or how they will put themselves in jeopardy or what from them is psychologically safe enough. Uh, another item is the importance of trust and boundaries. You're trying to set up a situation where there is some sense of trust. I trust that if I say this, it won't be used against me. I trust there won't be retribution. I trust I won't have ridicule. I trust that people will uh, try and engage me as much as they can. And also there are some boundaries in how we talk about things. We're going to listen to what people have to say. We are not going to rebut them. Just listen and take it in. Uh, here's how we're going to talk about stuff. These are the ground rules. These are the boundaries. These are the limits. Things that people have that give them some sense that this is not a free-for-all. It's not a food fight. And one of the ways you do that is by also having people understand that they have some control over the situation. They have some control about how much they say. They have some control about the way they say it. They have some control about how much they reveal. 
my ability to say, I've said enough for now. I'd like to pause and, and think a little bit more about what's going on. Um, I have some control about uh, how, how much we interact in, and in what kind of a way. I have an ability to have some say over what we've talked about. I have some say about how I talk about it. I have some say about how to protect myself or the limits of myself or whatever else. That I'm not put into a situation where I'm forced to say something, where I'm forced to reveal something, where I'm forced to be in a situation that I feel is dangerous because I'll just shut down or I'll just put out phony malarkey about what else versus real kinds of things. It's important to remember that threat is always in the eye of the beholder, that what for me as someone as a manager or perhaps a change agent facilitator is not threatening, could be very threatening to somebody else given their their, uh, childhood, given their ethnicity, given their cultural background, given their experiences in an organization, given whatever it might be. And so threat is always in the eye of the beholder. And it's important that you as a manager or you as a facilitator need to not become the threat. So if you don't follow the boundaries, if you force a discussion, if you out somebody, if you press something so much that they, it's fearful, then you are a threat and you are getting in the way. And so you need to know your own dynamics about how you're dealing with something. The second item, in addition to being able to deal with safety or safe enough, is legitimacy. Now, one of the ways that people can knock something off the table is by making it illegitimate. Because by definition, things that are legitimate and appropriate can go on the table. So if that legitimacy is challenged, it gets knocked off the table. And that happens in organizations all the time. And so for me, there's always the who, what, why, when, where, and how of legitimacy. And you are trying to make each one of those legitimate. So for example, who can raise the issue? Hey, you're not the right person. That should be dealt with from another office. What do you know about that? Who made you the expert? So we now delegitimize your ability to be the person to raise the issue. So if not me, then who is legitimate? Who could I bring into this to legitimately raise this in some kind of a way so people have to engage it. What can be addressed? That's an inappropriate topic for this discussion. Monday morning, afternoon meetings, Monday morning and afternoon meetings are dealt, we deal with certain things, but not that topic. That's a topic really for a retreat, Bob. Why are you bringing it up here? Or no, that's not an appropriate topic. That has nothing to do with business. So we delegitimize the topic, gets knocked off the table, we can go back to what we were doing. So you you have to make the topic legitimate in some way, legitimate against the values of the organization, legitimate against the uh, the ambitions of the organization, legitimate against the desires of the group. Whatever it is, it has to be considered legitimate. Why do we need to address it? Well, that's that, that. There's no reason we need to address that. That has nothing to do with what we're doing. Somebody else should deal with that. Why do we have to deal with that? And so your, your ability to make it a legitimate topic, given the group, given its mission, given its uh, 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 values, given its desires, performance, expectations, whatever it might be, you need to be able to say why that's important, when to address it. Oh, no, not now, Bob. Not this week, not this month. We're dealing with quarterly items. That isn't the appropriate time. So if not now, when? And you don't just raise it uh, arbitrarily. It's like when, as in like when, <laughs> next week, next month, whatever. And that gets you back to when and where. Um, where do we address it? Well, that's a topic not for an in-the-office meeting. Can we do an out-of-office retreat? It Can that be a, a half day, a day, two days? Whatever it might be. But uh, our ability to say, where is that a topic to be addressed? And if it's not, if we're not the right group to address it, where in the organization is it the right? And how do we get it there? Is that a board of directors? Is that the executive suite? Is that a a council? Where might it be? And finally, uh, a tricky one is how can it be addressed? Well, you know, that's an important topic, Bob, but we really have no safe way to talk about that. Or I I know people have tried to talk about that and it's turned into a, a terrible discussion. And so your ability to say, well, there are ways to deal with it. Here's a suggestion of a, of a particular approach that people have used successfully in the past. Here's a write-up of how it was done in an organization that we all admire. So your ability to make something legitimate, 
who, what, why, when, where, and how legitimate, and your ability to make something safe. If you can do those two things and nothing else, you're more likely to get something on the table and to try and be able to deal with it in some kind of a way. So let me go over a couple things. Uh, it's kind of important reminders. The reason you are dealing with something that is not openly uh, expressed, that's being hidden, is because you're trying to empower the organization or empower the person or empower that group so that they have more choice and more ability to perform. You're not doing it because somehow you are a righteous person who sees things that are hidden and throws them out on the table. It fits somehow with what that group wants. It fits somehow with what they desire. It fits somehow, even if they say, I don't want to talk, deal with something, but they know they have to deal with it. But you're there to help them, not to prove how smart you are in finding something. Some competencies that you might want to check to see if you have, or you might want to uh, uh, embellish in some kind of ways. Your ability to facilitate and deal with conflict is important. Your ability to deal with diversity, because often what goes on is you have people who have different mindsets about things, given who they are and their their life experience, your ability to deal with emotion and not just rationality, your ability to establish and maintain boundaries for how something will be talked about and facilitated, your ability to reframe a discussion from being intense win-lose to perhaps polarity or something else. These are all skills that help you because if you just put something out on the table that's been difficult to discuss, and don't have the ability to facilitate that discussion, it will get knocked off the table and it'll simply prove there, see, we told you you can't talk about that. There, see, it was dangerous. We told you so. So raising something or trying to get something on the table, you need to be ready to deal with it and not just say, well, I put it out there. What do you want me to do? If you put it out there and you're the one that's instigating it, then you really need to be able to deal with it once it's out there. Every Covert process, everything that is hidden does not need to be addressed. There's always something that's not on the table. There's only so much you can put on the table and other things are off. And so not now, later, another time. Why are we addressing that? We're addressing it because it is getting in the way of the individual or the group or the organization. We're addressing that because they say they want to address it, even if they're having difficulty with it. But you don't need to automatically put it out there simply because I know something that's hidden and I'm going to put it out on the table. No. Why are you doing that? What are the ethics behind that? And um, you have to always remember safety. You have to always remember legitimacy. And you have to always remember that you have to create conditions that are safe enough for people to deal with it. And uh, it's always in the eye of the beholder and not you. And so your ability, and it's, it's something that I often will do uh, if I'm working with a group and they just, they, they just seem unable to deal with something or they skirt around it or they deny it or whatever else. I'll reflect in my own mind I, something like, I wonder what is about this topic. I wonder uh, what makes it unsafe for these people to discuss this topic. I'll explicitly think that in my mind. Sometimes I'll even ask the group what makes this a difficult topic or why it seems like this is unsafe to talk about. Why is that? But more often I think about it in my own mind. And then I begin to do things that I think might address the safety needs of the people in the group. So that's always an important thing to try and remember. And uh, I'd like to give you uh, a, a question that you can reflect on now, but you can also use it any other time you want in your organizations. And it's really a core question that uh, I sometimes will put out to people. And that is to the, an individual, if I'm coaching them or a team or the organization, what is one currently covert or hidden topic, theme, issue, whatever it might be, one and only one, I don't want a whole lot, I only want one, what's one thing that if it were put on the table and successfully engaged, would have the greatest impact on your performance? What's one thing that is currently not being dealt with that if it were dealt with successfully would have the greatest impact on your organization? So if you have been thinking about what's on your table, what's under the table, what's above the clouds right now, what's one thing if you put it were put on the table and successfully engaged would have the greatest impact on performance? And you can reflect on that after this video is over. 
And finally, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is an important one. If you are a change agent, a manager, or even just a, a, a somebody who excels in your performance or seeks to excel, look in the mirror. Your own ability to be aware of your own covert processes, your own biases, your own issues, your own tendency to see things. I've had colleagues who somehow or another are, they've never worked with a group in their entire life that has diversity issues. Of course, it turns out that they have difficulty themselves dealing with diversity issues, but they've never run into a group that has it. Or I, there are no politics here, or no, there's no power here, or no, there's no emotions. So are there things that are difficult for you to deal with that you need to strengthen your ability to deal with it? Are you afraid if it came up, you wouldn't know how to manage it or facilitate it? These are areas for you to grow in and for you to develop yourself in, in order to be more proficient and to be aware of in terms of your own limits of your own competencies and your developing competencies. So that's a lot about covert processes. I hope I've given you some ideas to reflect on and think about. And I hope perhaps if you might go back through this tape and at certain points, pause if you want to think about things. Good luck with what you deal with. And remember, it only needs to be safe enough. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. On behalf of everyone, uh, may I say a big thank you to you, Bob, for sharing this amazing theory, covert process theory with us and helping us to understand that um, the hidden dynamics in organization change is something that change agents do need to pay attention to. And I um, I particularly find your points about creating a safe environment and establishing the legitimacy really resonate with me. And I hope that uh, all of your audience, uh, just like me, learn so much, reminded so much by what Bob talked about. And do spend your time with the rest of um, your colleagues um, discussing about what might be the covert processes dealing in the change that you're working on now. The rest of the contact information about Bob is all at the end of the video.